Yeah. Uh, thanks. So uh, we titled this presentation from coffee breaks to collaboration and studying social networks to understand change in higher education. But it's really just kind of a fancy way of saying that I'm going to present my PhD research and PhD progress and the paper we um, published. And um, this PhD project is under, in the supervision team with uh, Bjarte Hanisdal, Tony Roxo, and Robert Kortz, who have all been instrumental in in kind of navigating this landscape and helping us understand um, what is it that we need to study and, and how to do it. Um, and in the invitation, let's just see. So yeah, in, in the invitation to the, to the DLF, we kind of mentioned very briefly um, this question, can a casual conversation by the coffee machine spark a revolution in teaching methods across the country? And I really don't know if I'm going to be able to answer that question, but at least it, I hope it's going to help us think in a different way about social interactions, about social networks that we develop as part of something that maybe seems as everyday and mundane as, as a conversation by a coffee machine and how something like that can actually have large scale influence potentially. And here to be able to do, to have this kind of discussion, we basically need to talk about two things. One is what is actually change and how does it happen and what are these different types of change? And also what are social networks and how are social interactions influencing um, change? So first to start talking about change in higher education, I remember back when I was a student um, back in Croatia, we had a discussion about the state of Croatian higher education at that point. And I remember one of our teachers saying, well, Croatian higher education is like a horse carriage on a highway, whereas everything seems to have developed so quickly, so drastically. Almost all sectors seem like they are, you know, beyond the, you know, beyond us. Higher education seems to be very slow, very resistant, very inert. And for me, that was very interesting. I have this comparison of a horse carriage on a highway, quite quite memorable one. So we were also thinking, um, not not us, but other. Um, researchers, other scholars had this similar notion. One of them is Theodore Hesburgh. He's an American um, educator who back in the 60s or 70s said that university is one of the most traditional of all institutions in the society, but yet at the same time, it's most responsible for the changes that ended up resulting in us being the most changing society in the history. So the kind of the, the, the summary is that there is so much inertia, yet there is still so much change. Some, some authors even say, oh, we need to study even non-change before we study kind of theories of change. Um, and we notice that there is really not a simple, you know, stimuli response between external changes, what is happening in society, such as changes in population or e economic growth and changes in higher education. And that is being, Clark says that it's, our beliefs, beliefs of those who are inside of a system that interfere to define what the external flows mean. So we are the ones who define what are these external changes and how we interpret them. And it is definitely true that higher education has undergone massive changes. Um, I think it was UNESCO who some years ago said that in the last 15 years, there's going to be more students finishing higher education just in that 15 years than in the entire history of higher education. So we really see that we have this you know, inflation of knowledge, whereas something that used to be uh, had a weight of a master degree, now it's a PhD. So it's kind of, everything has shifted. So a lot has changed. But the real, the, the real reason why there is a lot of inertia, at least it is so believed, is because um, we have developed a very complex and a large system as a higher education. They, in theory, they always say that there has to be a difference between an emerging system, a very new one, and a system that has is developed, such as uh, higher education. And when you have such a large and complex system, it becomes full of constraints upon change. And then they say that many changes have failed because they were unable to accommodate to these existing structural constraints. And these constraints are very important because they help us define and also defend areas of professional concern within an institution. Right. As we have also grown as now I'm thinking about higher education as a whole system, not just the department, but, you know, everything as we have grown, we have also fragmented, we can kind of compartmentalize, which also helped us to become more adaptive. So if you think of, for example, if there is a department at the faculty of, of psychology 
that has shut down that will really have no consequences for the Department of Earth Science at the Faculty of MATNA, right? So this also has some sort of defense mechanism. But we also have to acknowledge that we have undergone quite a lot of change, right? We had the Bologna Declaration of 1999. We take it today for granted, but it was quite a huge change back in the back when it um, appeared. We also have very recently blueprint for the European degree that I think last month came out. And for those who are interested, I think Norway will have a conversation about it. There will be a presentation somewhere um, discussing what it means for Norway, Norwegian higher uh, education. So you can also, I can send you a link to that if you're more interested. And also very recently, just actually a few days ago, it came to my attention that there was also this proposition that international PhDs and postdocs should take mandatory credits in Norwegian language during the contract period. And then different people will have different opinions about all these changes. Are they good? Are they bad? What do they mean for us? And you know who actually made these decision, decisions? Uh, one important thing to note here is that all these, in this case, three changes that I showed, they are what we call kind of top-down changes. So we don't really have a lot of influence over them. And I mean, this one was in 1999. So I was only five years old. So I definitely didn't have any influence over that. I barely had influence over my own life. But kind of point is that it's top-down changes that we are not really too concerned um, in the research that we do. Uh, what we are more concerned is something else. We are more interested in academic departments. And that's one important thing to mention is because they say that when you talk about academic change, you need to specify the levels at which it operates. And this is also for several reasons um, because you know, different levels of change are going to behave completely differently depending on, on a lot of influential factors. And for us, we realized, and many other authors suggest that academic departments seem to be most productive and arenas for change, and that for several reasons. One is because in the department, you have significant control over courses that are offered at the department, right? And there can be pedagogical changes without the need of some external approval or external dis discussion. You may say, yeah, there are still constraints within the department, so we only know what's happening in our own course. We don't know what's happening elsewhere. But nonetheless, it is a potential problem that is somewhat easier to solve than if it was a large scale, you know, university level problem. And also maybe most important for what we study and how we study change is the reason uh, that information about teaching practices and ideas are located in the daily discussions. And this basically brings us back to that initial little graph that you saw and the two people um, by the coffee machine. And that is what is the role of these daily discussions that influence us. So if you think about those two people, again, a conversation that may seem completely mundane for them, maybe about a new idea or maybe a new teaching method that they um, plan to introduce or something. And they think this was the end of the conversation and that's it. This may have resulted in even more people finding out about that idea. And as it usually is with social networks, suddenly there's quite a lot of people um, who have heard or have had some information about that conversa initial conversation. And how it usually is with, with social networks and social systems, you will realize that some people will say, yeah, that's the best idea I've ever heard. I want to find out more. I really want to know, you know what's happening. I want to try it uh, in my own courses or whatever. Um, you will have those people who say this is the worst thing I've ever heard. You know, this I, I'm stupider just having heard that information. Um, and then you will have a lot of people who will simply be indifferent. They will not have an opinion. They will not yet know what they think about it. They will maybe say, okay, I'll see what happens. Maybe I'll try something similar. Maybe I won't. We'll see. The whole point is that we are interested in all these people. So all these different kinds of perceptions that people have towards whatever is being discussed. We are curious, why do they behave in, a, in that particular way? Not only what is the role in the network that they are part of, but also what are their characteristics? What makes them exactly who they are? And then we can study that through kind of different levels. Um, in At least in social sciences, there are different variables that you can study. You may be Kind of thinking well maybe we can see what's their age and how they are maybe older staff think differently than younger staff and so on 
or maybe some gender teaching experience, academic position, or how many courses uh, they teach. These are all kind of very surface level approaches, how we can study different people in net different people in network and how they behave. But as I'm gonna show a bit later, the options are basically endless. There's uh, numerous ways you can study people in, in, in social situations and social networks, including personality traits. You may be interested if introverted people are more prone to introducing changes than extroverted uh, people and so on, or motivation was the role of external compared to uh, extrinsic compared to intrinsic motivation or beliefs, perceptions, identity. And I will show how basically you know, options are limitless. And the way we do that is, I think maybe the easiest ways to compare it to traditional educational research, at least the way it's done in, in, in quantitative research, is that when you do a survey and you're asked to finish a survey, you become part of a certain collective and then your answers are part of a group that you are representative of. So for example, did you have prior experience in something and then you either did or did not. And then you we look at, is there any statistically significant difference between those who have had prior experience and those who haven't had? Or one more common is also with your academic title. So we're often interested, what's the role of PhDs compared to, I don't know, full professors? And so on, or you can have, you know, some some numerical values such as teaching experience or years of teaching experience, where we see what's the, what is there any correlation between years of experience compared to whatever it is that we are studying? For example, beliefs about student-centered learning or beliefs about importance of, of peer feedback, let's say. And the way we do it with with we call it kind of unraveling the web, but. Um, the way we like to approach it is we can still use everything that I previously mentioned, but what we are more interested in is the, these relationships between me and everybody else. And what is the role of these relationships? How many people do I talk to? What's the intensity of these conversations? And also how is that embedded in a larger structure of, in our case, let's say a department. Um, and that's what we basically did in the study in a paper that has been published uh, two months ago or a month ago, I'm not sure. Uh, we have tried to combine social network analysis or the social network theory with a change theory. And we did it by asking the staff at the Department of Earth Science here in Bergen to list all colleagues with whom they had informal teaching conversations, uh, informal conversations about teaching and about research. That resulted in us having two separate networks um, that we can look at. And they were also asked at the same time to complete a survey that measures their rate of innovativeness rela relative to their peers. And I will show you how both of these things look like. And this would be the network survey where we, we removed the names, but there was a list of all staff um, at the department. And you could choose how often did you talk in the last six months about teaching, and then you were asked to say the same thing, uh, how often do you talk, uh, have you talked about research related topics in the last six months? And then you can choose from these five uh, options. Another thing that we also ask them is to finish this innovativeness survey. So you don't have to look at that, it's just to show you how it looks like. But this is based on this diffusion of innovation theory. So this is one of the change theories that, that exists. We like this one because it we think it fits really nice with the, with the social network uh, narrative, but it basically discusses this process through which a certain innovation or an idea spreads within a system. And they define innovativeness as a rate at which an individual, so any teaching, teaching staff, adopts a new idea relatively earlier than other members of that system. And they say there are five categories of people related to their innovativeness, right? And then those who are most likely to adopt an innovation very quickly. They are innovators and early adopters. And then it slowly goes down towards laggards or what we call late adopters. They would be the ones to least, to be the last to adopt a certain innovation and an idea. So how does this look in practice in, in the study that we, we published recently is that we have a social system. Let's say this is the Department of Earth Science. When they did the innovativeness survey, based on the responses they had on the survey, we can categorize them 
to the categories uh, in which they would end up based on their answers that are relative to their peers. So we had 16% would be innovators and early adopters. We would have early majority, late majority. And then in the end, we would have late adopters. This is now for us, it's an information about how they perceive you know, change at the departmental level. Another thing, you, if you remember, I mentioned they also did the social network survey. That also means that we know with whom I talk to at, a, at the departmental level. Now, it's important to mention that these are all anonymized, so I don't know who this particular person is. For us, it's more important to know what the characteristics of the, of, of the networks are. So how many people I talk to, how often I talk to, and so on. And what are these relationships between us? So do I talk to people who are also innovative, or do I talk to more with people who are completely you know, resistant? And does it even matter in the end? That's kind of this big question. And then how do we also fit in the larger um, network? Is it true that innovative people will be at the center? Is it and that uh, those most resistant ones are going to be in the periphery or is the truth somewhere, something else? And these are basically the main findings. Because we asked them to do, to indicate both teaching related networks and research related networks, we have ended up with two different networks. But we have realized that we have strong to moderate to strong correlation between these two networks, which means that if you and I talk together about teaching related things, we are very likely to talk about research related things. So there is this kind of teacher teaching research nexus that also became quite interesting and um, something that we can discuss uh, a bit later. Um, because we realize that we tend to talk both about teaching and research at the, with the same people, we started looking also what is the role of research groups um, at the department. And then we ran what is uh, they call it the community detection algorithm, which is an algorithm that basically looks at just raw data without any demographic information about gender and then belonging to a research group and so on. It just looks at you know relationship between people. And the algorithm detected in the graph that we have four subgroups. And for us, that immediately became very interesting because we know that at the department, we also have four research groups. And then we started looking, okay, is there any overlap between what the community detection algorithm detected with the four subgroups and with the um, four research groups that we have? And what we noticed is that we basically had almost a perfect overlap between the subgroups detected by the algorithm and between the research groups that we have at the department. So if you can see, there's two letters. So it's basically A, B, C, D. If it's A, A, it means that it belongs to the subgroup A and the research group A. And only in four examples, we have a situation where there is no such overlap, where a person maybe belongs to one subgroup that is detected by the algorithm and a different research group. But majority of the, of the individuals ended up belonging to the same research group which means that there is more informal teaching conversation within a smaller disciplinary group than across it. So there is more conversation, let's say, in here than they talk with everybody else. And then we started looking at the innovative staff. So if you remember by the with the normal distribution, innovative staff are the 16% of the, of, the, of the population. So it's only a few people who really kind of push ideas and they want to introduce new changes and so on. So we were very interested in what are the characteristics of their social networks. And we realized that they have the largest personal networks you can see here and that they are the most influential in a network. They tend to be central in that network. They tend to speak with most people and they tend to have most influence in the network. And that also became something interesting that we said oh, that's something that we have to kind of elaborate on a bit later. Another quite interesting thing for us that we found is that these few innovative people have the highest, re very high reach within the network. So six of them basically talk to the rest of the 66% of the network and, on, and six of them are responsible for third of all conversations that have happened at the department in the previous six months. So there's definitely quite a big role that they play when it comes to informal teaching conversations. Um, and then finally, 
because we know that they talk to a lot of people, we were very curious about uh, if they talk to themselves or well, we don't know if they don't talk to themselves, they might do that as well, but you know, among themselves. And then we realized that when we look only at innovators, they almost have a perfect density of one, they have density of 0 0.8 and density means um, number of conversations divided by the total maximum potential number of conversations, which maximum being one, right? So they are very densely kind of um, connected with almost everybody talking with everybody else within the group of innovators, which is not really the case in other um, examples. And here we are, we may also argue, but it's just few people. So it's much easier to have high depth density with less people than more people, but late adopters also have quite a, uh, have exactly the same number of people and we have much smaller density, basically just two relationships. So we can see that it's the innovative staff that are kind of pushing these conversations or it's either a lot of people are talking to, to the innovators in at the department. And basically there is some things that we were, um, that we have learned from this, from the study that we conducted. One relates to the teaching and research nexus. That's an ongoing conversation and that's an ongoing debate as well. Does a do, is there such a thing as a teaching research nex uh, nexus? And we have found, at least in our example, that there is. We have seen that people tend to speak to same colleagues about both teaching and research. And then some suggestions for enabling change, for facilitating change, at least at the departmental level, is that change could potentially be framed more holistically to involve both research and teaching related activities and that there are you know that we could implement strategy that will utilize this overlap between the two networks to facilitate successful po positive relationship um, another thing is then what is the role of research groups in in at least in our example but it it, it appears in other examples as well and we say that, well, that means that we should focus our effort on smaller organizational subunits to promote change rather than individual people. Because we also know from you know, Roxo and Martinson study is that these smaller microcultures, they are based on trust, common developmental agenda and a shared responsibility, which also means another good thing about having such a group is that if we are to introduce a certain change, if that change fails, the risk is no longer just on me as the individual, it's kind of shared in the group. So it's, we are then more prone to take some risks and try to do and, uh, something and try to introduce certain things. And then finally, what is the role of innovative staff and what does that tell us about introducing change um, in, at the departmental level? And we said that they should be, you know, if, you can, if you can pinpoint who the innovative staff are at your department, they should be a focal point if you want to kind of uh, implement meaningful transformation because they tend to be most, let me just move this, they tend to be most active and integrated members of the system in which they participate. That means that in this discussion of implementing changes and investing resources in, in changes, we should, we should um, use these resources to support innovative staff rather than spending time persuading those who may be more resistant because it's, this is such a you know it's a very natural process of introducing changes and we need all these different perspectives they are all it's not we shouldn't say that okay we need only innovative staff and then we should you know forget about the the resistant ones right there is no good or bad it's just how the process works and we have realized that there's quite a big role of innovative staff in that process and that basically leads us to the question, what are the next steps for the project and for the research? And we realized that we just want to expand on what we have done so far. We only had one department and that limits what we can discuss and what we can say and what we can kind of conclude about change. So we said, well, let's put other higher departments into the study as well. And now we are currently, uh, a data collection is underway where we have invited other IR departments to fill out a survey that asks a similar questions about your social networks at the department. But now we look at the perception of, of departmental climate rather than asking about innovativeness. We're looking at 
how does the departmental climate, how do people feel at the department relate to, to their social networks at the department. And then hopefully we would at some point have also more in-depth interviews to better understand the role of social networks. So it's not just this kind of pure surface level quantitative, you know, numerical analysis of networks, but that we actually can talk to these people and see how they perceive change and networks. And then how can we go about having a more holistic way of, of implementing changes um, in higher education? So I think that's pretty much it. I think time is okay. I didn't go beyond or anything, but. Thank you for your attention. And then if you have any questions, please do.